Hi everybody, Michael Britt here from Psych Files, the psychology podcast that tells you what psychology is really all about. And in this episode, I want to talk about what's been happening a lot in uh, a lot of talk right now about some pretty uh, kind of upsetting things going on with the science of psychology, or at least the, the understanding that psychology is a science. And uh, this has always been a big challenge for us to, to, to help people understand this is a science. It's not just about the public perception that psychology is all about psychotherapy, sitting on a chair, someone on the couch, you know, talking about your feelings. It is a science, which means that we conduct research studies, we have control groups, etc., collect data. And one of the things I do uh, every day is I've got TweetDeck open on my computer, and uh, I, you know, I listen to people talk about psychology, and uh, I always find that a lot of uh, students will, will tweet things like, um, why are we, I thought this was psychology, how come we're learning about the body? Why are we learning about neurotransmitters? Why do I have to take the stack class? Why do I have to learn about algebra? And what you find, you get a little taste of this in intro psych, but as you find you get, get into psychology a little bit more, you find a lot of things surprising about what you have to learn, including you have to learn a lot of stats and quantitative methods, all right? Because we, uh, we, use, we employ those methods to find out things about people, all right? So, but a couple of things have happened this year, been a little bit upsetting. Uh, one of them would be the publication of an article about mid-year by a well-known psychologist, which seemed to find some support for psychic ability. And the follow-up research on that has not supportive at all. But it came out, it was an article published in a well-known journal. And then recently there was a Danish psychologist who admitted that he had made up a lot of his studies in the data. So it, it's, a, it's a little tough, you know. Um, psychology is not the only science to have uh, researchers who do things that are not what they should do. So... Really neat article comes out uh, in, in one of the journals. Actually, it's been a couple of reactions to this by the field. And one of them basically, or well, the theme of all of them, is that we need to be and, and reinforce among ourselves how much more careful we need to be when we do research. Maybe there are some new methods. Maybe there are some new statistical techniques. Maybe there are some new ways of reporting research that we ought to make sure that we follow. And one of them, Right here, uh, False Positive Psychology, uh, published here in the journal Psychological Science by Joseph Simmons, Leif Nelson, and Yuri Simonson. False positive, that means what? You have, uh, it's positive, you have claimed something happened when actually it didn't happen. Okay, and that's a bad case there. That's where you do some research and you say, hey, I found something. And later on, nobody can find it, and it turns out it really wasn't there at all. Right? A lot of pressure on psychologists, well, any researcher, any science right now, because there, there's such a, this information overflow, overload, there's this flood of information, and the only way to really stand out is to do some research that seems surprising, uh, counterintuitive. And in the pressure to do that, the pressure to become well-known, the pressure to publish and then to, you know, get tenure at a college or university. Psychologists can, uh, researchers can overlook some really basic, uh, and, and you would even say, well, that makes sense. That's sort of common sense, right? I mean, some, some really important, maybe they're not basic, but they're certainly really important uh, things they should think about when they carry out a study. Now, let me give you an example. Now, uh, about a couple of years ago, I was down in Florida, and I made a little bit of video, which I put up on YouTube, but hardly anybody's watching. <laughs> Maybe 1,700 views or something like that. But what I did was I wanted to, to demonstrate in what I thought was kind of a fun way, uh, the idea of falsifiability, which is kind of a you know heavy term. Maybe that's why I didn't get any hits on it, because I titled it falsifiability. Not everybody's looking for that when they go <laughs> onto YouTube. But falsifiability is a very important term. It just basically says, hey, look, if you're going to make a, a, a hypothesis, it should, be, it should be specific and it should possibly come out false, right? You can't just say, you can't make a hypothesis. I think I've talked about this in an earlier episode. You can't just say, well, I predict. I'm making a prediction that something really interesting is going to happen this year. All right, that's way too vague. So I did something similar on the beach. Uh, I just simply stood in front of a pile of shells and I said that um, I am going to look among these shells and I'm going to find some th a shell that looks like something. 
That was my prediction. Went looking around the shells, and sure enough, hard to believe, I found this shell. Right? It, uh, and what does it look like? Huh? Again, not surprising. Looks like a face. All right? I got an eye here. I got a nose and a mouth and a chin. Right? I mean, what are the odds? Well, actually, the odds are pretty darn good because I didn't say what I would find. I didn't say how long it would take me to find it. I, um, I didn't say I'd find a face. I just said I'd find something. So if you leave, you know, enough variables open, well, of course you're going to find something, right? Uh, so you know that's not good, right? And what I did as a follow-up is then I stated, okay, I am going to walk, I think I said something like three feet in and three feet to the right, and I'm going to look in a little circle that's about three inches in diameter, and I'm going to find a shell that looks like... I guess I could say a face, but it would be better if I'd made really specific. A shell that looks like a pumpkin. Or a shell that looks like, I don't know, whatever, a computer. So I did that, and of course I did not find something. That's what we have to do, though. We have to make predictions that can come out false. We've got to be specific. We've got to be careful about what we do. And so you know that that just saying, ah, I'm going to find a shell, you know, you know there's no higher force involved there. You know, there's shells that look like faces all the time as long as you use your imagination. All right. So, when I got to grad school, something kind of similar occurred. I was working with a researcher who was sort of known for not having the best, you know, procedures in place. And uh, so, as most college, university professors have, they have access to hundreds of students. So, if you've ever been in one of those big university classes, you might know they have, uh, you know, three, four hundred students. Advantage, you can collect data kind of quickly. Disadvantage, you can collect some crappy data pretty quickly, too. So what he did was something along those lines. He can give out all kinds of questionnaires. All kinds of, you know, fill-in-the-blank sorts of things and scales and questionnaires. And you can get hundreds of responses in within, what, an hour? And what he did was he then threw them into a computer program and looked to see what came out significant, found one, and said, all right, there you go. That's significant dreams up a reason why there might be a relationship between these two things, and then says, let's write a paper on that. I'm going to write a paper. That's bad research. That's very similar to the whole shell thing. You're just throwing it out there, and something comes up, and something will come up. Something will. And then you decide, or you make it appear, that that's the thing you were looking for all along. And then you can publish it. And unfortunately, so, so there's pressures to publish, and unfortunately, you know, the, the, the current process is that journals, journals will publish it, right? They won't publish research that um, you did and you didn't find anything. Uh, well, you know, under the somewhat understandable uh, reasoning that, you know, who wants to read an article in which you finally state, well, I, I looked at this and this and this and I didn't find it. Not terribly interesting, unless, of course, the previous researcher had found it. That happened with the Mozart, right? The, the Mozart research is supposed to make babies smarter. Well, the first one has seemed to find it, but uh, everything else did not find it. So replication was very important there. Uh, but replication doesn't always get published. And not finding something doesn't always get published. So there are sort of pressures and the kinds of pressures that can make researchers of any school disregard really good procedures, like having a good hypothesis. All right. So this article, False Positive Psychology, the author here, uh, Joseph Simmons and Leif Nelson and Yuri Simonson, lay out some, some pretty darn good guidelines that, that all researchers sh should follow. And I think you'll, you'll find these you know, so you'll say to yourself, oh yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so number one was authors must decide the rule for terminating data collection. So here's the idea. What if I did not find a shell shaped like a, like a face? I'm not sure which way makes the best sense. I could, I could turn off the camera, go and look in another pile of shelves, shells, until I found something. Does that make what I found any more... Believable? Actually, it makes it a little bit less believable because I just kept looking. So first I make a prediction that I'm going to find a shell in this pile. I don't. So I just sort of, you know, they say put that in the file drawer. I don't tell anybody that. I go look at another pile and then I find the shell. That's not good. And so the same thing in research. You can't just collect a bunch of data uh, on 100 people 
even if your prediction's good, you don't find it. And then you say, I'm going to go get another hundred people. You know, I'm going to just keep going until I find it. Well, you will eventually find something. And uh, then publish it. Uh, that's not good. You have to be... So you gotta... You know, you should know. And there are statistical procedures called a power analysis, which will tell you, look, you need... You need this number of subjects. You need 100. Or if it's a strong effect, you may only need 50. But you you have to state that up front rather than just going until you find it. Not good. Number two. Gotta collect at least 20 observations per condition. All right, so you can't have five people in one condition and 20 people in another find something significant and then go, huh, okay, I'm going to report that. You know, I mean, it depends. Sometimes it's hard to find subjects, but, you know, you have to have at least 20 subjects. Some people say 30 subjects. You know, you, you that's a case where maybe you, you find a significant result early on and then you stop. Well, you can't do that either. You, you just... You, got, you have to have at least a, a goodly number of subjects in order to have your results believable. Okay? Number three, you must list all the variables you collected in your study. So, you know, you can't... And he, did a, he does a very funny study here in which he has uh, subjects listening to music. So he has them listening to this song called When I'm 64 by the Beatles. And so they randomly assign some subjects listen to that and sub some subjects listen to a control song. And then in the end, he asks them their age. And you know what he finds? That the subjects who listen to When I'm 64 were chronologically younger. So listening to that song made them younger. That's not possible. And you know that's not possible. And he admits to that. Not possible. But if you manipulate the data, you, he did find it. Doesn't make any sense, but he found it. And the reason was... Is because he collected all kinds of data that he didn't tell you about. He asked them all sorts of questions. He asked them their age. He asked them their mother's age, their father's age. Some silly questions about um, who they thought would win uh, the Canadian hockey, uh, whether or not they thought computers were complicated or not, right? Uh, what their you know, favorite foods were. So in a very similar vein, you cannot do a study that looks good then collect all kinds of other stuff. And if it doesn't come out right in your first shot, you then start looking at it. Well, what if we split it up? Um, this is called massaging the data. <laughs> what if we look at it this way? What if I uh, look at it that way? Uh, what if I do this? And what if I include this variable and that variable? You can't do that. Again, you got to keep it simple, you know, parsimonious. Make your prediction. Choose the number of subjects. Analyze the data. Maybe you want to manipulate it, you know, massage it later on if you are on an exploratory study. But you got to admit to that. Not make it look like you meant to do that all along. That's not good science. Uh, let's see. Report everything, including the things that didn't work out. Right. So this is significant, eh, but this isn't. This isn't. This isn't. And that isn't. Of course, nobody wants to do that, but. You should do that so that the people who review it before it gets published and winds up on Twitter, <laughs> they can say, uh, this looks good. Or, you know, this did come out, but ne but these didn't. I don't, I think you have to do the study again uh, before we start making any announcements. Uh, and if you throw people out, if you throw out subjects, you have to let everybody know that. Now, uh, and you have to analyze the data with them in there. Now, here's the thing that happens. You got your 400 college students. It's not a bad idea. There are some disadvantages. There's disadvantages to every subject group. But you get your 400 students, and you give them all kinds of questionnaires. One of them, particularly of interest, is, a, let's say, a 1 to 20 scale. And everybody, you know, the average is maybe 6-something, right? So pretty much everybody's low. But there's this one subject, and he's got a 20. Kind of throws things off. Well, it's okay for you to go and look at that subject. And if you find, for example, that he circles 20 to everything, you know, because there are some subjects who are just not that interested. They're sort of in a hurry. They want to get the heck out. So they just circle numbers and say, hey, am I done? I'm going to go. You can throw that person out. Right? That's legitimate. But you need to, you know, make some, some decisions beforehand. What is, what is a high score? Is 15 and above sort of a ridiculously high? Maybe 18 and above? State it. Throw the person out. That's okay. 
Uh, but then do the analysis with that person in as well a second time, just to see if it's still there, you know, um, because it's too easy to just sort of look, you know, in your head as a researcher what it is you're hoping to find. And if you start eliminating people, you, you might, you know, change that definition a little bit. Well, this guy's a 19. You know, well, let's throw him out too. I mean, where are you going to draw the line? All right. You got to stake that up front. All this has to be done up front. So there's a, a couple more in here, but you can see where we're going. There's a, there's a, there's always been a, a you know, a psychologist who say, look, you know, this is a science. We have to make sure that people understand that. And unfortunately, you, you know, the popular, uh, you know, media, you don't see enough of that. But there are plenty of researchers in all fields who know that to, to produce good, solid findings, we have to be careful about what we do. All right, there you go. That's what's going on in psychology. Hope you enjoyed this episode of The Psych Files, and I'll see you next time.